Welcome to another EduMed video and in this video we're going to be going through the ICU UK audit data. This is released on a weekly basis and I'll be trying to go through this every week. Now th this is a data based on the published results from the 4th of April 2020 in the so-called ICNARC data and I'll put a link to the website in the description below. Now it's worth saying that although I'll be going through this data and trying to tease out some trends, it's really early on in the uh, pandemic and certainly in the UK experience. And so everything that we take here, take with a pinch of salt and certainly the trends may change as the numbers get larger and so any variations start to get ironed out. We'll look a bit, little bit at the demographics and contrast this with what we've seen elsewhere, say for example in Italy and in um, Spain and of course in China. We'll th think a little bit about length of stay, see what levels of organ support we're needing to give these patients and finally and probably the thing that people are most interested in, what's the survival like for these patients. Now again we're very very early on in this disease so this data has to be taken with a pinch of salt and it'll be interesting over the f uh, preceding weeks to see how things go on. Now, the ICNOC data that was published on the 4th of April looked at 286 units, of which at least 210 had um, at least one patient with um, COVID-19, either suspected or confirmed. There were 53 units that had no COVID, and about 20 um, units hadn't actually provided any data. Now, I'm sure as time goes on, Almost all of these units will see some patients with coronavirus, but for the moment at least, it seems like it's early on in the disease stage. Even within this, there's been 2,621 critical care admissions up until the 4th of April. And of these, 346 have died, but rather reassuringly, 344 have been discharged alive. Um, over 1,500 are still in critical care. Now, again, it's important to emphasise that all these patients have a staggered admission. So some of these patients may have only been in the intensive care for 24 hours and therefore not had time to either die or to be discharged. So as time goes on, we'll get a much better idea of what the mortality rate for this disease is. But the initial signals seem to mirror that of the longer term uh, data that we're getting from places like China and Italy. Just thinking about the UK specifically, you can see here um, that the distribution of admissions for patients who are positive for COVID, i.e. confirmed COVID-19, um, it's pretty much localised to the south and particularly the southeast of England. Um, specifically, London seems to be the bit biggest um, centre for getting COVID at the moment. As time goes on, this is certainly going to change and pretty much every part of the UK, I'm sure, will have cases of coronavirus at some point. Now, just looking at the demographics, again, this is early data, but it does seem to show the average age, so both the mean and the median, for patients getting um, coronavirus and being admitted to intensive care is around about 60. Now, what I'd like to highlight here is on the um, right-hand side, this group is patients with viral pneumonias that were non-COVID, and we're taking um, data from 2017 to 2019. And it's quite useful to compare the percentages between the two to see how things are going and also of course the mean and median in this case. So you can see here that actually for patients with non-COVID um, viral disease coming to intensive care again the median age and the mean age is around about 60 and the range that you can see here the interquartile range between 52 and 70 and 48 and 70 effectively pretty much the same. So we're probably looking at the same groups of patients. Now, originally there was um, studies suggesting that older patients were at higher propensity of developing significant disease with coronavirus. And we'll go through age distributions later in this talk. 
However, on the face of it, it looks like it's fairly similar in what it's affecting between the viral pneumonias that were non-COVID compared to COVID. The big difference, and it's quite a striking difference, is the propensity for male patients. You can see here 73% of patients are males who are being admitted to intensive care with critical respiratory failure with COVID. Whereas with normal seasonal flus and viral pneumonias, it's almost an equal um, distribution between men and women. So certainly this disease seems to have a propensity towards developing more severe disease, at least in men. Or there, that's the signal that we're seeing, not just in the UK, but elsewhere as well. There's a lot of worry about pregnant women, and certainly there was some early data suggesting that women in their last trimester may have an increased risk of develop of having complications and potentially even having cesarean sections. It's really difficult to tease this data out because certainly in a time of heightened worry, the threshold for doing a cesarean section may well be less, um, especially in countries where access to cesarean section is much easier. But the reassuring thing here is that it doesn't seem like there's a spike in the number of patients who are pregnant. And so they don't seem to be at a particularly high risk of developing um, COVID, or at least the early data is such. Certainly we'll be able to know a lot more as the disease progresses and more patients are exposed to COVID over the following weeks. The data on ethnicity is interesting, and I'll show you a graph which actually normalizes it for the census data in 2011. But there was some suggestions that patients of um, Afro-Caribbean descent may be slightly resistant to um, developing significant complications of COVID. But the reality is, if you look at it corrected for the number of people in the population as a percentage, then actually it's probably the case that it's all ironing out to be just a reflection of the number of um, people in the population who are Afro-Caribbean versus the number of people who are um, Caucasian, which is why the number of um, patients tend to be more um, Caucasians developing severe um, COVID infections requiring intensive care. It's simply because there's more Caucasians in the population. Another signal that was starting to come out early on in the disease was that patients with very high BMIs were being admitted into intensive care. And there was a thought as to whether patients with high BMIs were at slightly higher risk of developing severe consequences of COVID infection. Again, I'll show you in the data, and this is preliminary data, that this is probably not the case and the um, severity of disease is not that related to high BMI. Now, the slight confounding factor to this is that any patient with a high BMI is automatically going to be more difficult to ventilate with positive pressure ventilation, which what is what these patients are requiring. So it might be adding in a confounder and a complicator as opposed to actually being the fact that it has a propensity to patients with higher BMIs. Now, this is the data looking at age. And I just want to emphasize that this is ICNARC data. So what this is looking at is simply those patients that are admitted to intensive care. So if you look purely at this and look at the 70 and above age group, you might say, oh, actually, less patients are 70 and above who are um, critically unwell. Well, that's not quite the case because a lot of these patients, I suspect, who have severe coronavirus disease with an age over 70 may well have significant comorbidities precluding them from coming to intensive care. And certainly the frailty index increases as you get above 70. So just because you're seeing a dip doesn't necessarily mean that there are less patients with severe disease age 70 and above. It just means they're not making it to intensive care. Now, if you look at um, this, this is males versus females. The males are in the um, grey and the females are in blue. You can see just by eye, almost in every age group, there are double the number of men who are coming to intensive care compared to women. We don't know why this is. 
and this is even more pronounced at the age groups where we're seeing the majority of patients coming to intensive care, which is between 50 and 60. So certainly age does seem to be a risk in developing severe COVID-related uh, respiratory disease. Now, going back to the um, ethnicity data, this is the graph that I was alluding to. So you can see just on the face of it, there are far more Caucasian patients um, with coronavirus coming to intensive care compared to all the other ethnicities. However, if you have a look at, um, first of all, uh, patients with non-COVID, so this is the blue line here, you can see that it almost equally mirrors that of the um, coronavirus, where it's sort of coming up and then down. And you can see it's almost equal with the um, patients with the local population. So you can see there are just more Caucasian people, and therefore there's more coronavirus. There are less Asian people, and proportionately, there seem to be less Asian people with both viral pneumonias that are non-COVID and COVID infections. So I suspect that a particular ethnicity doesn't really um, protect you and it's just a reflection of the overall population which the hospitals are seeing. But again, this is very early on and we'll need more data to be able to say for certain. And this is the data looking at um, BMI, and you can see that um, the vast majority of patients um, seem to have a BMI of between 18.5 to 40, and this seems to uh, reflect the age the age matched and sex matched distribution in the general population. So what this probably means is that everyone is equally affected by this, um, irrespective of their BMI. Now, the thing that I really wanted to highlight in this um, slide is looking at the um, pre-morbid state of patients, so how they were before they came into hospital. And you can see here that there is a significant difference between the two groups. Now, obviously, I say significant. We haven't done the statistical analysis, but just by eyeballing, you can see that almost 90% of the people who are coming into intensive care um, have a good pre-morbid state whereas it's only about 70% in the non-COVID state. So when looking at the mortality data, you've got to bear in mind the fact that these patients had a much better baseline than patients who had viral non-COVID disease. In terms of very severe comorbidities, and we'll go through that in a later slide, what that means for each of these, you can see that um, none of them really had very significant um, comorbidities uh, up until now and yet this acute severity is so much worse in COVID almost two, two thirds of patients are requiring mechanical ventilation within the first 24 hours of admission to intensive care and you compare that to only 40 percent in the non-COVID viral pneumonia so this is a much more severe disease that we're seeing compared to normal seasonal flu and its brothers and sisters. The Apache score is a score of basically how unwell someone is and you can see that actually it's a lower score for patients with um, non with COVID disease compared to non-COVID so they we're seeing a little less in the multi-organ failure the lower the score um, the less organ failure there is. And this is certainly reflected in uh, the early data that we were seeing from Italy, where people were talking about patients just having pure respiratory failure. Now, as time goes on, I suspect, given the trends that we're seeing, we might start to see a little bit more of the multi-organ failure. But certainly as patients come into intensive care, they seem to have an isolated um, respiratory disease and the other organs haven't particularly failed at that point and the, the, those multi-organ failure patients tend to occur a little bit further down the line not just not in the first 24 hours. Now as I alluded to right at the start we have the outcomes now for 690 patients out of the 2000 plus patients in the study. Now of these 
346 died and 344 are still alive. So we're talking about almost half of patients coming to intensive care dying. And that's what's really scaring people because this does seem to be a disease that hits hard and fast and patients are not rec always recovering from it. And going into the mortality data into a, in a bit more detail so far, you can see here, so this is the COVID data. It's almost 50-50, those who live and those who die. You compare that to the non-COVID viral pneumonias, where almost two-thirds, more than two-thirds of patients are surviving. Almost 80% of patients are surviving. So people who say that COVID is like the flu, it is not. This is a much more deadly disease. In terms of length of stay for those who are surviving, it's actually quite reassuring. It's about four days and the median is two to eight days. Now, it's worth going and seeing my video in the series of COVID videos that I did on the tips and um, anecdotes, where we talk about patients having biphasic responses to their disease. And we are so early on in the data collection at the moment that it's, I would take these values with a pinch of salt because I suspect it's going to end up being much longer with patients either being readmitted to intensive care or being reintubated. But compare the four or five days with the um, interquartile range of between two and eight days compared to those with normal viral pneumonias that we've been seeing before COVID came along. And it's fairly similar. And the key point of that is with this pandemic, we are just seeing a huge increase in the number of patients who are coming into intensive care, but they're all staying for a similar period of time compared to the viral pneumonias. So the point being that these patients are going to be hanging around the intensive care for a long time. So it's not a, just a matter of the initial capacity um, of the intensive care's coping with, but these patients are going to hang around just like the viral pneumonias do and so capacity isn't just going to be an issue for the initial pandemic but it's going to be an issue for afterwards as well where new patients are going to be coming in with other pathologies such as heart attacks needing post-surgery um, intensive care for example um, we're still going to be very tight on beds for weeks and months even years potentially after this pandemic has hit the peak Now it's interesting just to see how many patients are requiring advanced uh, ventilation. Now we're seeing that about almost two thirds of patients at the moment are needing to be intubated who are coming to uh, intensive care. And the others are needing basic uh, support. So we're admitting patients quite early at the moment, partly because we've got the space and um, then allowing us to watch and wait with them. But just compare that to patients who um, were admitted with viral non-COVID disease. Almost 81% of patients admitted um, actually had um, just basic respiratory support. So we're seeing a lot more patients being intubated than with the seasonal flus. Now, part of this may be because we're avoiding using high flow oxygen and there's really not very clear evidence to for or against high flow oxygen in the um, COVID population. But certainly in the non-COVID population, we have used um, high flow oxygen with quite good success. The other thing to note is that other organ disease doesn't seem to be that prominent. If you look at renal, liver and neurological support, it's fairly similar between the, non, the COVID and the non-COVID. These patients are needing some advanced cardiovascular support, but it's fairly similar between the non-COVID and the COVID. Another really interesting thing to look at is looking at the amount of time that patients are staying on advanced respiratory support. 
This is six days in the COVID patients and about eight days in the um, viral pneumonia patients. I fully suspect that this value for the amount of time that the COVIDs are staying on advanced ventilatory support is going to increase as we get more data. We are starting to see many more of these patients with the biphasic response, the so-called L-type um, phenotype to begin with, who then progress into the H-type. Now, if you want to know a lot more about um, COVID, please go and watch my video series on COVID and the different phenotypes that we're starting to see. Interestingly, uh, renal support patients are needing just short stints and that might be partly related to the acute kidney injury. And again, please go and see my video on uh, the tips and anecdotes of uh, the UK management of uh, COVID so far and the fact that we may have got fluid balance and PEEP strategies wrong to begin with, which might be why we're seeing that level of renal support and it might actually be better than that once we get better at managing these patients. I'll just flash this up for you to have a look at and please pause the video to get a better idea of what we mean by advanced ventilatory support, basic respiratory support, advanced and basic cardiovascular support. I think it's quite useful. And similarly, looking at comorbidities going back a few tables. Again, I've a summary, this is a summary of all the, all the things that they mean by having those different categories. I'm not going to dwell on it. I'll let you pause the video and have a read for yourself if you're interested. Um, I find this quite a useful graph because what it's showing is that the majority of these patients are needing respiratory and cardiovascular support. Other organ support isn't as common for these patients. We are seeing some renal support, about 20% of patients needing renal support, but I wonder whether that will improve as we get better with our strategies, both with fluid management of these patients and potentially our PEEP strategies as well. Again, we'll only really know for certain once we've got a, high, a longer um, duration data set. I think this is a really interesting plot and it's worth just taking a little bit of time to look at what this shows. I want you to focus first of all on this blue line. And what you're seeing here is those patients who are receiving mechanical ventilation in the first 24 hours, i.e. they have been intubated within 24 hours of coming to intensive care. And here we're seeing the um, number of, we're seeing survival here in the solid line, and the dotted line here is the number of patients who are being discharged. And what I want you to see is this, this is for all the patients who have outcomes, so it's 690. So overall, in the patients who are needing to be intubated within 24 hours, only about 35% are surviving. So almost 60% are dying. You compare this to patients who do not need mechanical ventilation in the first 24 hours. And here, 70% of patients are surviving. So even though we talk about this almost 50-50 people dying and surviving, we are starting to see a signal where patients who are being intubated within 24 hours of coming to ITU are not doing so well. Now this could mean a number of different things. Could this be that we're waiting um, before intubating these patients for too long and so when they come to intensive care they're sort of almost on death's door? Or are we seeing a phenotype of patients who are rapidly deteriorating and we've certainly anecdotally seen these patients who come into hospital, need a couple of litres of oxygen and then very rapidly over the course of a few hours deteriorate to the point of needing intubation and are very difficult to ventilate.
I suspect that is more the phenotype that's being mixed into this pa group of patients who are having mechanical ventilation within the first 24 hours. However, it is a sobering thought. Maybe we should be bringing these patients into intensive care early and intubating them early. And that's certainly been the policy in the UK up until now. Obviously, as resources become more scarce, we, will need, we might need to revisit that. But it's worth just considering. Again, the data is too new. There's too little of the data to really have a good idea of what the right answer is. But it's food for thought. So just by way of summary, looking at the outcome at the end of um, critical care. So these are patients who needed advanced respiratory support. And you can see in a bit more detail that almost 70% of patients are dying. So if your patient is being intubated within 24 hours of coming in, they are very likely to die. Only 30% of them are surviving. You compare that to patients who aren't needing intubation and ventilation, almost 80% of them are surviving, which is actually a really good signal to have and a very reassuring one. Because bear in mind, we're looking at a super selected group of patients. This is not all patients with COVID. These are only those patients with COVID who are sick enough to warrant coming to intensive care. So if they're not needing intubation within the first 24 hours of their admission, they do seem to be doing well. So I want that to be a word of encouragement to all of us looking after these patients, that there is light at the end of the tunnel. In terms of length of stay, like I say, we're talking a, about a week for those patients who are being intubated and ventilated compared to a few days for those who aren't. And again, I think that's really reassuring. Organ support seems to be, um, in terms of cardiovascular support and renal support, it's only really those patients who are needing advanced ventilatory support. Now, that might indicate that we have got our ventilation strategy slightly wrong. Maybe we're giving too much PEEP. Maybe we're drying these patients out too much. Um, or... It might just be a reflection of the fact that these are sicker patients, and I suspect the reality is it's a combination of both. Interestingly, if you look at the number of patients um, who are um, being discharged alive from critical care, rather reassuringly, we're seeing even some of these patients who people were saying, oh, maybe they shouldn't be going to intensive care, the patients who are 70 plus, they are surviving. Almost a third of them are discharged alive from critical care. So again, I think it's worth bearing that in mind. It's not as f it, This is not an entirely fatal disease, and certainly if they haven't been intubated and ventilated in the first 24 hours, they may well do quite well. In terms of survival, now, if you remember before, we talked about sex and men being a much higher risk of developing severe disease with coronavirus. But when they do get to intensive care, they're equally likely as women, maybe women slightly more likely to survive. But generally speaking, they're, given the small numbers, we're still within the um, error bars for them to be almost equivalent in terms of the number of patients who are surviving and the number of people who are dying in, as ter in terms of percentages. And similarly with BMI, we're not seeing a big difference in those patients who are dying between those who are very obese or those who are very, very um, low BMIs. And encouragingly, once they've been uh, discharged from intensive care, in terms of those that are needing um, assistance with activities of daily living, almost half of them aren't needing any. So that's really reassuring. Um, however, what's slightly worrying is that if you look at the number who, requ uh, who need um, uh, assistance of, uh, with activities of daily living, in those who died, almost half didn't need any. And that might indicate that this is taking both well and unwell patients. Um, 
and as such um, pre-morbid condition isn't always a great um, predictor of whether patients are going to survive or not. And the biggest signal is those patients who need only basic support, ventilatory support, the majority of them were discharged. Whereas those patients with advanced ventilatory support, a lot of them were dying. So you can see almost 67% were dying and only 30% um, were surviving to discharge from intensive care. So in terms of summary of what we found on the ICNARC data, I think it's early days. So any data that we take from this is got to be taken with a pinch of salt. We don't really know what we're looking at yet. And it's going to take months, if not years, to really get a good handle of what this data is showing. At the moment, it seems to be located mainly in London and southeast in the UK which means that the worst is still to come. This will hit the rest of the country, and when it does, there are going to be far, far more patients who are coming into intensive care. The average age is about 60, which is the same as seasonal flu, but patients are about twice as likely to die, and men are um, twice as likely to get severe disease as women, if we assume that both men and women are exposed and get the virus um, equally in terms of actually con uh, actually contracting coronavirus. If it's the fact that um, women are more resistant to um, developing coronavirus in the first place, then possibly that might indicate why once patients come to intensive care, there's a 50-50 chance um, for both men and women to die. In terms of ethnicity, it seems like all ethnicities are affected and just the variations that we're seeing are probably more a reflection of the percentage of the population that's represented. A sobering thought is that the majority of patients who are coming into intensive care have good premorbid function and that this isn't sparing patients who are functionally well beforehand. Um, now that's partly related to the way in which we're admitting intensive care patients in that uh, we have frailty indexes and things like that what we're using and we're at an early stage putting limits of care in discussion with the family if they have multiple comorbidities and we think that intensive care might not um, be a good idea for them in terms of giving them a good quality of life afterwards or um, in fact may not be able to survive an intensive care stay. In terms of intubation, it does seem like these patients are requiring intubation at an earlier stage than with the viral pneumonias. Now, it's difficult with the data that's presented in the ICNAC um, audit to say whether that's because we have a lower threshold for intubating patients early with COVID or whether it's that these patients can have very rapid progression of disease and therefore present with quite significant ventilatory failure quite quickly. I suspect it's a combination of both, but certainly anecdotally, we're seeing a lot of patients who are deteriorating quite quickly with this disease. For anyone who says that um, the coronavirus is just like this, a seasonal flu, it is not. About twice as many people are dying from this as with the seasonal flu and it seems to be in all ages. The um, thought that it's just old people that are getting it and young people aren't is not true and the more data that we're seeing the more we're starting to see that every person in any age group is susceptible to this disease. Many more are needing intubation and that's probably, like I say, a reflection of a lower threshold for intubation with this disease and also the rapidly progressive severe pathology that we're seeing with these patients. Other organ support seems to be similar to that of uh, other viral infections and they do seem to, at least at the moment, show a similar length of stay as the flu. My gut feeling is that I'm I suspect we'll start to see longer lengths of stay with the COVID patients, just given this very odd biphasic response that we're starting to see in a certain group of patients with COVID.
Um, and the final thing is once in intensive care, men and women seem to have the same risk of death. Now, what I want you to take away from this uh, talk is that we really don't know very much about this disease. What we're seeing here are early signals. They seem to be corroborated by some of the longer term data that we can see in Italy, Spain and China. However, we really don't know what we're dealing with at the moment. This is something that appeared only at the end of 2019, so we have got lots and lots to learn about it. I don't want anyone, based on this um, data, to rest on their laurels, because actually this is quite scary, and it shows that there's quite significant disease burden there. And what's even more worrying is the fact that we haven't really seen it equalise around the country, which means the UK is likely to see things get much worse. Also, people are thinking about the peak of this disease, but what this data is starting to show is that these patients have long-term morbidity. They are going to require long stays in intensive care. So even once we've hit the peak, in terms of intensive care usage, it's going to remain high for weeks, if not months, and possibly even years after we've hit the peak of this disease. And that's assuming that there's going to be a single peak, which if you look historically at other pandemics, we often see a second peak and even a third peak in disease later. I hope this has been useful and if it has please like and subscribe to the video and I'll continue to do um, more of these uh, videos as new ICNARC uh, audit data comes out. I'll leave a link to the ICNARC website so any of the stuff that I've talked about um, you should be able to go and have a look for yourself and look at the data in a bit more detail. Thank you very much.